Yeah. All right. Okay, let's get started. We only have 41 meetings in this class, and we're not meeting for lecture 38, so we are down to the wire. Um, okay, so we do not have class on Friday, okay? What we're going to do on Wednesday is I don't have any notes. I don't have any material. That's not what Wednesday is about. Wednesday is me coming in and troubleshooting your project. That's what we're doing. So um, I'm, I'll love with you. I'm not even taking attendance on Wednesday. I'm just going to come in. You have your, uh, uh, if you have any mask stand, cab, anything like that, just come on in. That's, that's, that's all Wednesday is about is troubleshooting for your project. We do not have class on Friday. Your project is due on Friday, so if you got your project done early, turkey time can begin early, or can begin early, so if you're okay with that. So today is our last lecture in the land of influence lines. How did the lecture, the, the applications lecture go on Friday, the pre-recorded one? Does that, that make sense? The most critical aspect that I'm interested that you uh, uh, were able to understand was that the Dead load is applied everywhere. The live load is applied anywhere. You can apply the live load wherever you need to generate worst case response. But the dead load, you apply everywhere. So, so if you have, a, let's say, a self weight of a beam, if a beam weighs 200 pounds per foot, you take 200 pounds per foot times all the area of the influence line, positive and negative, because it exists everywhere. So, sound good? You do have a homework assignment assigned today that's due Wednesday, uh, which is on um, the Mueller Reslaw principle. So, uh, on uh, using it towards ASHTO live load models. We got a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. Let's get into ASHTO land. All right. Now, um, I'm going to really quickly go through the. Um, why is this not. Oh, it would help if I plug this in. That's why it's not working. All right. So. I'm going to really quickly go through, again, just a recap of the Mueller-Fresnel principle again, that we are removing from the structure the ability to resist um, a response of interest. We move that structure through a unit displacement, and then whatever the resulting dis uh, deflected shape is, that is the influence line. Today, we're not really drawing any influence lines. Today, we're using them, okay? Um, now, I do want to make sure that you're comfortable with the patterns for influence lines, but you know that for reactions that equal one at the, point, at the reaction of interest, zero at all other reactions for internal shear and moment, they look something like this, zero uh, at the reactions, and then for shear, there's a jump, uh, a total jump of one at the section of interest. You go you tend uh, downwards on the left, upwards on the right, um, such that these two lines have the same slope. For moment, um, you rotate this point up such that the total slope on either side uh, is one. So they, bas they basically both just become algebra problems. Now, today's um, the focus of today's lecture is applying influence lines, and I want to talk about bridges. Okay, so we've been talking before about how influence lines are primarily applied in the land of bridge engineering. But what we need to do is talk about the live loads that we put on bridges, okay? Um, to be clear, when you're designing a bridge, you need to account for the vehicular loads that are on the system. But I would argue that the cars don't really uh, uh, induce any appreciable load demand. I mean, we are not designing bridges for Honda Civics, okay? We're, we're not. That's, that's not what we're designing them for. Um, what I am calling... Uh, what, what I say that matters is the truck effects, and particularly the term that I'm, I'm interested in are what are called exclusion vehicles. So exclusionary vehicles are things like uh, concrete mixers, short haul vehicles, semis, those vehicles that have extreme force effects. Okay. Now, what we do, though, is we do not design bridges for every single permutation of live load that a, that a bridge could experience. We're not having to design for every single truck that, the, uh, that a, a bridge might uh, be subjected to. Instead, AASHTO, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, how many of you have had 342? Yeah. Okay, so you've heard of AASHTO, right? So if, yeah. if, you, haven't heard, if you haven't had transportation uh, seat in 342, uh, you will learn uh, a good deal about AASHTO in there. 
but the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, um, is the governing body that, that handles a lot of the um, specifications related to road and bridge design. So there's a couple of um, really, really um, fundamental design uh, guidelines that they publish. So how many of you have ever heard of the AASHTO Green Book? I'm just curious. So if you've heard of the Green Book, the Green Book is the guidance for the design, the geometric design of highways uh, and whatnot. And so the LRFD Bridge Design Specification is also a publication by AASHTO, and they set forth the guidance on how to design bridges in the United States. Now, the way it works, and I'm going to go a little bit off on a tangent in the land of bridges, is that AASHTO will set forth the minimum standard that all bridges uh, in the United States must be designed to if they want to qualify for federal funding and whatnot. Uh, and then the states might come in and uh, add additional layers of um, additional layers of specificity on top of it. So I give you an example, um, and we're going to talk about this HL93 vehicular live load here in a second. But ASHCO will specify a live load model that every bridge must uh, be subjected to or must be able to withstand. And then another state, let's say Kentucky, for example. So Kentucky is a good example. Kentucky uses a vehicle that's a little bit heavier than this. And so the idea is that if you can, if you design a bridge in Kentucky, not only will it meet the minimum standards specified by ASHO, but it'll also meet Kentucky standards. And every state has their own nuances to uh, bridge design, what they'll allow, what they won't allow, um, certain uh, loads that you need to account for, certain loads you don't need to account for. So, for example, in West Virginia, we have some roads that are called CRTS routes. Uh, coal resource transportation uh, system routes, and so CRTS routes have to be designed for a little bit of a heavier vehicular load for obvious reasons. Uh, and in Kentucky, they just design all their bridges for a little bit of a heavier load uh, and what have you. So it just um, it, it just depends on where you're at. But what I'm talking about here is, for the most part, what most bridges are going to be designed for. The vast majority of bridges, for example, in West Virginia, are designed for the HL93. Now, what is the HL93? In short, the HL93 is sort of the um, statistical worst case scenario loading that you could expect a, um, a highway bridge to have to deal with. And I could get like really into the weeds into how they developed this model with way in motion data and get into the history of where this model came from. Uh, but I'm not really interested in doing that in here because here I'm more interested in your ability to use it. But suffice it to say that this vehicular load model represents the uh, a statistically reasonable worst case scenario loading that bridges would experience in the United States. So for example, this truck, the HL93 design truck, I want to be clear, this truck doesn't exist in the real world. This is a load model that represents worst case truck loading uh, uh, in the US. Okay. Now the AASHTO uh, live load model consists of three components. It consists of a what we call the design truck, it consists of the design tandem, and it consists of a design lane. Now the design lane is equal to 640 pounds per foot or 0.64 kips per foot. And just like the last homework assignment, it is a live load, it is a distributed live load, and you just place it wherever it needs to go to simulate worst case effects. So the design lane, you could sort of think of the design lane as sort of a stream of traffic. And so you just place it wherever you need to place it to generate worst case effects. Now, the two sort of vehicular components are this design truck and this design tandem. I'm working backwards. Uh, the design tandem is sort of intended to simulate heavy concentrated forces that a bridge might experience. And so it, uh, uh, the design tandem uh, consists of two axles. Each axle weighs 25 kips and they're spaced four feet apart. So you can think of the design tandem as two 25 kip loads that are four feet apart. And it is your job as the engineer to move those along the structure to generate the worst case effect. And I'm going to show you how to do that uh, today. So that's the design tandem. The design truck looks like this right here. So the design truck consists of a front axle that weighs 8 kips and the two rear axles weigh 32 kips. Okay. Um, now the distance between the first two axles is fixed at 14 feet. The, uh, the distance between the two rear axles is variable. It varies from 14 feet to 30 feet. But I can tell you right now, the vast uh, majority of all the analyses that you are going to do is going to use the minimum distance. Okay, And 
let's just keep this real simple. If I have uh, a bridge, right, and I want to generate, let's say, the worst case bending on the bridge, am I going to generate the worst case bending with those loads spread apart or lumped together? Lumped together. Stick the loads right in the middle, right? So to generate the worst case response, it would make sense that this distance needs to be 14 feet, not 30 feet. Does, does that make sense? Now, it's your responsibility, again, it's your responsibility to vary this as needed, but again, the vast majority of what you're looking at, you're going to be limited to a 14. Now, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of terminology. This truck, this particular truck, is sometimes called the HS2044. The reason why it's called that is so the 44 stands for 1944 when the truck was initially developed. So we've actually been using this truck model, the truck model by itself, for some time. But the 20, here's where the 20 comes from. Right? So this, let's say this eight kip load. So that eight kip load corresponds to this axle. So if the axle weighs eight kips, each wheel weighs four kips. Make sense? So four kip wheel and a 16 kip wheel, four plus 16 is 20. So that's, that's where the naming came from. So the first two wheels add up to be 20 kips and 44 came from the fact that it was configured in 1944. So we were actually using just this truck for so a little bit of institutional history. We were using this truck and are still using this truck today, but we were using this truck for a very, very, very long time. Okay. So when we first started to really codify bridge design, the way that it worked is we had either the truck, essentially either the truck or the lane. And what we would do is as engineers, we would apply the truck and we would apply the lane and we basically take the worst of the two. And that worked, you know, when the, when the load was initially developed. Then fast forward about, oh, 50 years. And then we find that truck loads on bridges started to increase more and more and more. And so when we started to, to develop this uh, uh, philosophy of design called LRFD, we will talk all about LRFD and steel design next semester. Uh, but the idea was, okay, bridge loads are getting heavier. We kind of need to calibrate this load a little better. And so what we said is instead of using the truck or the lane, essentially after a lot of weigh and motion studies, we found we would use the truck and the lane. That superimposing those would give us a little bit more of a, represent, a representation of real world uh, uh, force effects that bridges were seeing. And so that was calibrated in 1993, it's HL93 live load model, when the first edition of ASHTO came out, uh, ASHTO LRFD came out in 94. So a little bit of institutional history for you. <clears throat> now. What I want to do today is I want to go through the process of determining ASHTO live load model force effects on a given structure. And so we have a really simple structure, okay? So we have a bridge that is 80 foot long, and I want to determine ASHTO envelope response at a point 30 feet from the left support. Now I'll tell you in bridge engineering land, uh, and I think I mentioned this before, how often do we do this? in bridge engineering. Remember, how many sections do we cut up? I mentioned this before we do this on 10th points, right? So what we would normally do is do one at 8 foot, 16 foot, 24 foot, 32 foot. I picked 30 because the numbers end up being a little easier to, uh, uh, to calculate, but you'll, you'll see what I mean uh, as we get through this here in a second. So let me, let me pull this up. Now, um, I went ahead and drew the influence lines for you. So I have the shear influence line and the moment influence line. I went ahead and did those for you. Because I think at this point, you should be able to compute the shear and moment influence lines with relative ease, right? So here we've got, you know, for the shear influence line, we drop down, drop up. We drop down 3 eighths, drop up 5 eighths. You know, you kind of look at the dimensions, that kind of makes sense. Um, total jump is 1. And here for the moment, jump up one, jump up one, or jump up so the total slope is one, and so that height ends up being about 18.75. So, like I said, I went ahead and gave you the influence lines for this problem. And so what we're going to do is determine the shear and moment envelopes due to the ASHTO uh, live load model at, a po at this particular point. Okay. So ultimately what we will have is we will have, let's say, uh, for the lane load, we're going to have a, a maximum negative shear, a maximum positive shear, a maximum negative moment, 
and a maximum positive moment. Now, what we're going to find, though, is that for every, and the same thing is going to be true for the tandem and the truck. So we're going to get like 12 different values at the end of this problem. But what I'll tell you is that for every one of these, that negative moment one is going to be zero. And the reason it's going to be zero is because if you look at the influence line, there is no negative region on the influence line, right? So it's going to be zero for all of them, okay? Uh, but let's, let's take our time with this. Let's take it one step at a time. All right. Does everybody have this copy down or do you need a minute? Okay. All right. So I cheated a little bit because I copied and pasted this image over again. There, let me let me drag this down a little bit because I don't want I don't want this to get in the way. Okay. So let's deal with the easiest one first. So for the design lane, remember the design lane is 0.64 kips per foot, okay? So what we need to do is we need to generate the worst case force effect due to that design lane. Now, in order to do that, um, what we're doing is we're placing that distributed load where it's going to generate worst case response. But remember, how do you analyze, uh, um, how do you analyze uh, uh, a beam using an influence line when it's subjected to a distributed load. It's just the distributed load times the area under the influence line. So we need to get some areas, okay? So what is the area under these, uh, these influence line regions? So somebody help me out with that. What is the area of this triangle, let's say right here? So it's 0 0.65 times 50 over 2. So 0 0.65 times 25 is what? Fifteen point six two five. So this is fifteen point six two five. What about this one? This this uh, other negative region. And then for the moment, um, I think that one is eighteen point seven five times eighty over two. So eighteen point seven five times forty. Seven fifty. All right. Okay. So if I want to determine, let's say, the worst case, let's say positive shear due to the lane load, all I've got to do is I've got to take zero point six four times the positive area, which is fifteen point six two five. Because basically what I'm saying is that if I want to generate worst case positive shear, I place the load right there, right? Because that's where I have positive shear influence, right? That's the worst case positive shear loading I can muster, right? So what do I get for this? is going to be 0 0.64 times the negative area, negative 5.625. That one's going to be also um, probably a little kind from a numbers perspective. And what is that? Negative 3.6. So what I propose is that the worst case positive shear from the lane can be 10 kips and the worst case negative shear from the lane is negative 3.6 kips. So that's an answer right there. All right. Now what about the moment? Okay. For the moment, same idea. So now, what do we do here, okay? So our influence line for moment, 
tells us that if I, no matter where I put this load, I'm going to generate positive bending at section 1, 1. So for worst case positive bending, I put the load everywhere, right? So if I put the load everywhere, I'm basically going to say 0 0.64 times 750. And what is that? Four eighty, but for the negative lane, see my influence line tells me that if I place, no matter where I place load, I'm going to generate positive bending. So what is my worst case negative moment? Zero. So now. Now, I want to be crystal clear, okay, this um, notion of worst case positive effects, worst case negative effects, only arises with a live load. If I were to tell you that this beam is experiencing a dead load, let's say a dead load of two kips per foot, how do I determine the shear due to that dead load? I take the dead load of two kips per foot and multiply it by the sum of all these areas because the dead load is everywhere, right? If we assume it's a uniformly distributed load acting across the entire span. Whereas with the live load, I'm only doing positive and only doing negative. There is no range for dead load because it's permanent. It's not moving, okay? Does that make sense? All right, any questions on this? This should be fine. If you understood the last homework, and what I did in the last pre-recorded lecture, this shouldn't be that difficult. It's the new stuff that's going to be a little interesting. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Now, like I said, I'm working backwards here because I think that working backwards is going to make life a little easier for us. So let's put this here. there. Now let's do the design tandem. Okay. So the design tandem is, as I said, it's meant to simulate heavy concentrated force effects on, on bridges. So if you've ever been driving down the highway, and you see somebody hauling something that's really heavy, that's kind of what the tandem uh, is intended to represent. Now I have here an image of the tandem, okay? And let me blow this up a little bit so we, all, we can all kind of see it. But what we're interested in is really this part right here. See, the idea behind the tandem is that the tandem corresponds to two 25 kip loads that are spaced four feet apart, okay? And so the idea is that here's the tandem. What you're going to do is take this tandem and move it along the structure and figure out the worst case place to put it to generate the worst case response. But again, that's what influence lines are for. They make our lives a little easier, okay? So let's consider worst case positive shear as an example. So let's see if we can figure out what's going on with V tandem positive. Let's see if we can figure that out. So would you agree that, let's take a look at our beam. So here's the beam, and I want to try and figure out the worst case positive shear from the tandem. So 
I don't know about you, but should I place the tandem over here? No, it needs to be over here. In fact, what would probably make sense is to scooch it as far over here as possible, right? So really what I'm talking about is I'm talking about putting the tandem probably like right there, right? Make sense? If anything else, I'm going to start getting negative influence, so I, I need to figure that out. So specifically what I'm interested in doing is figuring out probably... I need that value on the influence line, don't I? Such that, you know, this distance is four foot apart. Okay? Th does that make sense? Now, I'll, sh I'll show you a little trick on how to compute that value. Okay, keep in mind, this is a line, right? If this is four feet, what's that distance right there? Say it again? 46. 46. So, watch this. So, if this is 46 feet, what I can do is I can say 0 0.625 times 46 over 50 is what? Anybody have an answer for me? 0.575. So that means 0 0.575. So I propose then that if I take 25 kips times 0 0.625 plus 25 kips times 0 0.575, that will get me the worst case positive shear due to the tandem. Does that make sense? Let me move this out of the way. Let's move this over here. Move that sort of up there. So it's sort of out of the way. Does that make sense? What do we get for a value here? A second on that? Okay. So let me ask you this. All right, now let's see if you all can help me out with this. So, would you agree that placing the, the, the tandem here gives me the worst case positive shear? Where do I place the tandem to get the worst case negative shear? The other side of the cup. Just do that, right? Okay. Exactly right. So, in other words, I have this value here. Oh. I've got this value here. I need this value right there, where this distance is four feet. I'm curious if anybody can tell me what that value is. And how? what's a simple way of doing it? What is that value right here on the influence line? Negative 0 0.325. Negative 0 0.325. Do I have a second? Yeah, because all you do is you say 0 0.375 times, in this case, 26 over 30. Okay. So now the... The worst case negative shear is 25 
is that, and what do we get? I mean, but just as you're doing this, think about what this influence line is doing for us, right? It's, I mean, imagine, I'm giving you a collection of loads, I'm telling you, figure out where to put it to generate the worst case response that we would ever need to design for, and then analyze the structure and give me that response. And we're doing it in a matter of seconds. It's really just amazing how powerful influence lines really are. So what do we got for this? So far, so good? Okay. All right. Now, for the moment, well, there's a little bit more we got to figure out. Okay? So, let's, let me show you what I mean. Okay. So, I propose... For the tandem, now I've got this drawn to scale, so I, this is going to be an easy question to answer. But I propose that there's two places that we could place the tandem to generate worst case moment response. We could put it right here, right? So where we got to figure out this and that, or we could shift it down a few feet and place it there. So, where do you think should, I should put the tandem? Should it be here or here? Place for option one or option two? Well, which value on the influence line is higher, that one or that one, if this is an equal four feet? Option one or option two? Two, two right? Because if I put it over here, that value on the influence line is going to be a little bit higher than this, right? I mean, this is all just linear interpolation, right? And I can go ahead and tell you that for the tandem, okay, what are we getting? We're getting 17.25 over here. This is after you do the interpolation. And this one is 16.25. So if I'm trying to generate worst case response, I need to place it over on that other end. So the worst case positive moment from the tandem is going to be 25 times 18.75 plus 25 times 17.25. And what do we get when we check that out? Have a second. With me so far? And again, just like last time, there's nowhere that I can place a vertical load to generate negative moment, so that's zero. I know that this is a little bit of a, an out there idea, at least compared to some of the stuff that we've done before. So I want to make sure that this is making sense.
everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. Now, if you're with me so far, let's do the truck. If you understand how we placed the design tandem, placing the design truck is really not all that challenging. Okay? So, first off, let me make that, again, a little bigger so we can kind of see what's going on. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, the design truck, um, the first off, you know, let, let's see if we can, you know, redraw this in a, you know, what I would call a structures friendly fashion. So we've got an eight kip load, a 32 kip load, and a 32 kip load. This distance is 14 feet, and this distance is variable. But again, if you're trying to determine worst case response for just about any structure, this one included, lump those together. So what I'll do is I'll say use 14 feet for this. And I just about any real world problem that you would be experiencing, you're going to use 14 feet. Okay? So, what I'm going to do here, since this 14 foot dimension seems to show up a, a fair amount, is I'm going to go to these influence lines and I'm going to see if I can do some interpolation at 14 foot intervals from our, our, our section of interest. So, in other words, I know that this value here is 0 0.625, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out, okay, what is this value if we shift ahead 14 feet? Then I'm going to do it one more, 14 feet. And I'm doing it one more because we've got three different loads that we've got to deal with. So we'll say this is 14 feet, this is 14 feet. Same thing over here. I've got... This value here, we're going to shift ahead 14 feet, and then another 14 feet. So I need that value right there, that value right there. Where that 14 feet, I know that's probably really small, so I'm, my apologies if that's difficult to read. So shifting ahead 14 feet uh, in either direction. Now, I went ahead and did some of the linear interpolation for you, so I hope that's okay. Um, this one comes out to be 0 0.45. This one ends up being 0 0.275. Okay? This one ends up being um, negative 0 0.2. This one's really tiny. This one is negative 0 0.025. Is that okay that I just did that for you? Okay. Now, here's the thing, though, that you've got to recognize when you're doing, dealing with the truck. See this truck model right here? There's nothing anywhere in the specification that says you can't have this. In other words, the bridge specification does not assume that you are only designing one lane, you know, one way only, you know, bridges and that the truck can't turn around. In other words, the eight kip axle, the front axle could be on the left side or it could be on the right side. Does that make sense? So let me ask you this, okay? Would you agree? Let's look at worst case positive shear, okay? So I think everybody's in agreement that I need to put the truck over here and I need to kind of locate it here. Do I do 8-32-32 or do I do 32-32-8? 32-32-8. Exactly, because that's going to give me the worst case response. So what I'm going to do for the worst case positive shear is I'm going to say that this needs to be 32 this needs to be 32, and that 
needs to be eight. That's going to give me the worst case positive shear due to this load event. Okay? So B truck positive is going to be 32 times 0 0.625 plus 32 times 0 0.45 plus 8 times 0 0.275. So what do we get when we chug all that out? Thirty-six point six. Do I have a second on that? Wait, I'm getting a little bit different. I got forty-three point two. That's what I'm I got forty. That's point six two five, point four five, point two seven five, and it's thirty-two, thirty-two, and eight. That's what I got. Bless you. Okay. I don't. I think it's when you put thirty-two for the last one instead of eight. Oh really? Yeah, that one's eight because. No, that, I'm saying like yeah, when you I plug that all in, it doesn't. It comes out to like thirty-six point six. Yeah, that's what yeah, I got. Also, oh, I'm. Six. Yeah. I will take it. <laughs> Write it down. Thirty-six point what? Six. six. The same important for a <laughs> All right. Okay. It happens. Okay. So for the worst case negative shear, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 32, 32, 8. So the truck's going to flip and go the other way, right? So I'm going to have 8 times negative 0 0.025 plus 32 times negative 0 0.2 plus 32 times negative 0 0.375. And what do we get for that? Negative 18.6. Negative 18.6. Do I have a second? Yes, sir. Okay. And I'm not going to trust my answers on that because I got something different there too. So, all right, does that make sense? Okay. Now, for the moment, okay. Let me show you what I'm going to do. Okay. So watch this. Okay. I've got an axle there. Okay. What I'm going to do is, just for the sake of discussion, I'm going to do 14 kips, or 14 feet, sorry, on either side twice, okay? I'm just doing this so that I'm systematic, okay? Now, when I do this interpolation, here's what I get, okay? I get, let's see, 1.25, I get 10. I get 13.25, and I get 8.25, okay? So that's with each of these being 14 feet, okay? So let's figure out where to place the truck. Would you agree that a 32 kip axle needs to go right here? This needs to be a 32 kip axle, right? Okay, so let's put a 32 kip axle right there. So let's say that this is 32, okay? Now does my next 32 kip axle, does it go to the right or to the left? 
goes to the right, doesn't it? That's 32, okay? Now, if this is 32, where does the 8 go? Does it go to the right or to the left? So 32, 32, either that's 8 or that's 8. To the right or to the left? To the left. To the left. So this needs to be 8, that needs to be 32. That's the worst case loading that I can think of based on... based on this configuration. And to be clear, dependent upon how you draw your influence line, maybe it's, maybe, or, or dependent upon where you draw your influence line or what your spans are, you might have a different load placement for a different location. So it's very possible. So this is gonna be M truck positive equals eight times 10 plus 32 18.75 plus 32 times 13.25. And what is that? I know what I got, but I'm going to not trust it. 1104? Do I have a second? Okay, that's what I got. Okay, so... Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, I know we're running short on time, but I got a couple quick things I want to show you real quick. Anybody got any questions on this? Now, I'll show you a, um, a set of bridge engineering calculations to kind of show you what this looks like in the real world. So, let me see if I can find it. So, I'll show you something. So, I think it's in research. Yeah. Although, this probably could go on another section of the report. This is part of a, a design evaluation that I did on some standards that I had developed a, a good little while ago. And so, basically, what this report is, is this, like, comprehensive bridge design. And so, if you scroll, like, a little bit later in the report, you start to find these right here. Okay. And so ultimately what a bridge engineer would do is they would take these tables that you see right here and start performing, uh, they would start combining these into essentially uh, what we would call factored loads that we would ultimately design our bridge for. So I'm going to snip this out of here to kind of show you what's going on. So. So this is kind of what these look like um, when you make them all pretty and whatnot. So this is kind of what they look like at the end of the day. And what you're doing is you're essentially evaluating these, like I said, at 10 points. Okay. And so what you see is you see a series of moments and shears evaluated at each 10 point, And they're, they're sort of split up into two groups. Okay. So what you have here are, these are the dead loads, right? So there's, there's no range associated with these. They just are what they are. But with the live loads, like the live load, you have a worst case positive effect and a worst case negative effect. There's also a fatigue truck over here, but don't really worry about that for the sake of the discussion. But look what's happening. Like at any one point, right? So like for the moments, like here's the worst case positive truck moment, here's the negative. Oh, it's zero because this was simply supported as well. Worst case positive lane, worst case negative lane, worst case positive tandem, worst case negative tandem. 
But this was all done at a very particular location on the bridge. We have to do enough of them in order to generate an envelope that's necessary for design. So what a software package will do is they will do what we just did by hand. They will do it at every tenth point to generate an envelope of, of forces to design for. So here's what you get for the worst case moments. And then down here, you do the same thing for the worst case shears. So for example, if you were looking at, let's say, point 0.3L, you'd get, let's say, a positive shear, negative shear, positive shear, negative shear, positive shear, or po negative shear. You know, just under those different force effects. Does that make sense? That's kind of ultimately what you would be uh, deriving for the purposes of a, of a design. And the very last thing I want to show you, do you remember how I said influence lines are always lines for statically determinate structures? If you have an indeterminate structure, they might be curved. So this is a structure that's indeterminate, and so this would be what the influence line looks like if it was indeterminate. Because keep in mind, if we remove from the structure the ability to resist response at a given point, it doesn't make the structure unstable. So if I lift this, it actually deforms. And so that's A, Y, and B, Y. Here's kind of what the shear looks like. Here's kind of what the moment looks like. How would you draw these influence lines quantitatively? Software. But ultimately, you would use mass tan or something like that. So. But again, the only time an influence line is curved is when the structures are indeterminate. The only time. Any questions? All right. I'm going to pull the code up again to make sure everybody scans it. Wednesday is troubleshooting. Troubleshooting for the project. Come prepared, ready to ask questions. That's all I've got. I will see you all on... Wednesday. Start.